this module, we are going to look at driven oscillations and uh, understand it also with the help of a numerical method which is uh, known as the Euler method. So, I will assume that we have already seen the Euler method and so uh, and yet I will try to make this discussion as self contained as possible right. So, uh, so there must be a way for you to go back and check out this video where we discuss the Euler method and where we work out the, the numerical tool which we I am going to just use this tool as if we have already done it and yet I will try to make this module also as self contained as possible. Right, so so at this point we have already seen some numerical numerical methods for solving differential equations. Right, so if you have skipped ahead, then perhaps now is a good time to go back and check out these those videos. But even otherwise, we'll quickly briefly mention what is what is happening here. So what is the driven oscillator? So the driven oscillator is a simple harmonic oscillator in which there is a forcing term right so we imagine the, the simplest a simple harmonic oscillator the simple harmonic oscillator is given by just this differential equation m times d squared x by dt squared equal to minus kx right so if you imagine that there is a spring connected to a mass m and the spring constant is k and so we know that it is just mass time acceleration is a force is, is given by minus k times x and the differential equation corresponding to this is m times d squared x by dt squared equal to minus k x and from high school we already know the the answer to this type of a differential equation is just given by x equal to a times cosine of omega t omega naught I have defined omega naught is equal to square root of k by m here omega naught t plus there would be both sine and cosine right so this is something that we were told is a solution. I do not think unless you have already taken somewhat more sophisticated courses, you would perhaps do not understand how to work out the solution for a general differential equation of this kind. So, the theory of differential equations particularly of this kind is quite well developed. So, there are systematic methods by which one can actually arrive at the answer to this kind of a problem. And uh, particularly differential equations which are linear in nature like the one we consider here it's it's linear because there is no no square in x right or this d squared by dx uh, by dt squared only appears as a linear object it's not d squared by dt squared the whole squared or you know there is no nothing like sine of x or no no complicated things involving x but you can have you know as complicated a, a function in t as you want and still it can remain linear and one very important case of this kind is a driven oscillator. So, you imagine that you have your uh, you know the mass m which is attached to your spring which is being kicked after every you know uh, by some or, uh, external force right you can think of a cosine omega t but you can also imagine uh, you know giving it some impulse every you know so many seconds right so it, it can have a time period t associated with it corresponding to which there would be a frequency so but suppose you imagine a cosine forcing function so you can have a square wave you can have a cosine wave you can also have these delta pulses you know all these kinds of problems one is uh, interested in one is you know it is a uh, it is easy to motivate directly from a physical perspective and these kinds of problems are also very closely related to circuits you know circuit phenomena where you have an, an voltage and some uh, resistive element element a uh, capacitive element so you can have an LCR circuit right and which each of these components of your circuit would perform roles which will eventually come to, down to a differential equation of this type and you have an external voltage and that voltage could be quite easily designed to be an AC voltage and then you would get something like F cosine of omega t right. So, once you have solved this problem from a mechanical point of view, it would be very straightforward to work this out 
on a circuit as well, right? Which is something which we will urge you to do, and perhaps there would be a homework of this kind, right? And so uh, it could also well be that my colleague Amber would describe some of these problems in the circuit language, and I might give you the mechanical uh, version of it, just so that you see different flavors, but basically it's really the same differential equations, and you should be able to spot either of these. And realize that really they are manifestations of the same. Okay, so the first step in dealing with differential equations of this kind is to do a non dimensionalization, right? We try to emphasize this repeatedly that it is useful to take a differential equation and tear apart, you know, uh, you know, all this stuff which is not essential when you are putting it onto a computer. Eventually, we want to put uh, this kind of a differential equation on a computer and solve it numerically that is one of the tasks right so of course in this case we will show you how in fact there is a, an analytical solution as well possible so but the first step is to non dimensionalize the equation by su choosing suitable scales expressing the equation in dimensionless quantities so if you want you can pause the video now here and try to work this out i actually urge you to do this and then after you have done your own version of non dimensionalization, you can cross check against the version that I have here. Right. So, then once you have non dimensionalized, so right now you see that this equation has a mass m, there is another parameter k, then there is another parameter omega. So, it seems to be a lot of parameters omega naught, I, I, I said was a useful quantity defined, uh, this will be equal to square root of k by m. So, how many? parameters would remain after you have carried out uh, this non dimensionalization exercise right so this is uh, an exercise worth doing and i urge you to pause the video and carry it out yourself so my own solution is the following so i spot that there is this omega scale right omega naught is equal to square root of k by which the natural frequency of your oscillations even when there is no external uh, external force being applied to the system from which we can derive a time scale. Time scale is just 1 over omega naught, so it is square root of m by k and then acceleration, right. Acceleration is something that comes from uh, my force, external force. The amplitude of the externally applied force is f and I have this mass m, so my I have a natural acceleration scale which is f by m and therefore I can actually get a distance scale. So, distance scale is square root of a t squared, right, which I could have equally got by directly doing f by k, right. So, f is equal to force is k times x, so I have these all these scale some of these are actually derived scales some of these they all come down from omega naught and from this f so and what i'm going to do now is go back to my original differential equation equation number 2 and then non dimensionalize it so the technique to non dimensionalize is simply wherever you have a dimension full quantity you just replace that quantity by the scale times that quantity and then lot of cancellations will happen and then you will end up with a, an equation which has no no which has been non dimensionalized so in place of x i will put f by k times x in place wherever i see t i will put 1 by omega naught times t and wherever i have omega i will put omega naught times omega so when i do this i get my left hand side is m d squared x by dt squared will become m times f by k omega naught squared d squared x by dt squared right so i have so in place of x i have f by k times x and in place of t in the denominator t squared right in the denominator i have 1 by 1 by omega naught squared but uh, times time t so which it becomes on the left side f by k times omega naught squared i have and likewise on the right hand side i have minus k times f by k times x plus f cosine of omega t. Omega t will just remain omega t because 
uh, you are going to replace omega by omega naught times omega and t by 1 by omega naught times t. So, they get cancelled and now you have the final equation which is just simply d squared x by dt squared is equal to minus x plus cosine of omega t right and here we have a non dimensionalized equation right. So, these quant so here you have a driving frequency omega which is actually does not have any dimensions it is a dimensionless quantity. Now, this is a pure differential equation which is a mathematical equation and then we will have to at a later stage once we have solved this we will have to go back and interpret what x means what in this in this non dimensionalized units ok. So, what is the problem we have? So, we have let us assume that we have to give also some initial conditions. So, suppose we give the initial conditions for this problem where in non dimension in dimensionless units if you have x of time t equal to 0 is equal to 1 and the speed of your particle is at time t equal to 0 is also taken to be 0. So, this is a second order differential equation which can be solved exactly analytically for all times and we will talk about how to do this. But however, it is actually it is useful to consider what happens to this in the limit of very large times. So, this is what is called a steady state solution of this problem and to do to get to the steady state solution we can make an educated guess also known as an onsort sometimes and that onsort is, is simply c times cosine of omega t. You try to mimic just the forcing term. So, it is as if for very large times the system has forgotten its initial conditions in some sense and it is only it is the drive which is causing it to closely mimic the drive itself. So, now if you directly plug in this onsorts into the differential equation into equation number 5, can you extract a constant c and find out how it varies as a function of omega and make a plot of this using Mathematica and, and see what it means right. So, this is an exercise which you should do before I show you the solution. So, I urge you to pause the video at this point work this out for yourself and then continue the video right. So, here is my solution. If I implant this guess c times cosine of omega t into the differential equation, then I have the left hand side is simply minus c omega squared cosine of omega t and then the right hand side is minus c cosine of omega t plus cosine of omega t. Therefore, I can go ahead and solve for c omega and I get 1 by 1 minus omega square. So, what does this tell me? This tells me that it is possible to find a solution of this kind and this will in, in fact turn out to be the steady state solution. And in fact, you, you see that if I were to buy this solution 1 by 1 minus omega square times cosine of omega t, you see that there is no connection of this solution to the initial conditions. It does not matter what my where I was initially and what my speed initially was the steady state solution will always be reached because it depends purely on the external drive. So, we will discuss this in a moment, but let us understand what is going on with this coefficient c of omega. So, the amplitude squared is of interest it tells you of the strength of these oscillations. So, if I were to make a plot of this this is what it looks like I have written it down ok let me do this and then I plot it. If I plot it so I notice that there is something weird going on at omega equal to 1. In fact, it, the system totally the, the amplitude totally blows up at omega equal to 1 and if I pause to think for a moment I realize that this is not such a surprise. So, what is going on here is the concept is, uh, is known as resonance right. So, this is a familiar concept maybe you have seen it in a course on waves or you know some oscillations type of course. So, it is uh, sometimes a desirable thing sometimes something that you want to avoid ok. So, here I have a plot of this amplitude squared right. So, we see that it blows up at omega equal to 1 and this is a signature of resonance. Resonance is the condition where you know if you drive your system at a very special frequency which in this case is its natural frequency. So, then somehow this is 
the external force is conspiring with the internal mechanism of your um, particle, you know, your mass m to make the amplitude, you know, very, very large, right. So, resonance is sometimes a desirable uh, point to drive your system at, at other times you might want to stay away from resonance. So, one example is, you know, that of armies which are marching across bridges, they are often advised to not march in step when they are walking along on a uh, on a bridge so as not to you know inadvertently uh, become a driving force which is if by some chance if the, the natural frequency of the bridge matches exactly with the frequency with which the, the army is marching on it, it may result in you know a, a catastrophe where the bridge may even collapse. So, so that is a, a context where resonance is not desirable, it must be prevented, but there are other situations where you want to drive your system at resonance so that you can generate these high amplitudes, right. So let us move on. So thinking about this whole thing as just a pure differential equation, so the theory of differential equation in fact tells us that there is something called a particular solution and a uh, complementary solution. So, in this case, the steady state solution turns out to be a particular solution. So, as you can see, it explicitly uh, holds out, right. If you choose your C to be this particular value, you can go ahead and plug back in into this equation and then it is going to work out no matter what time it is, right. It's, so, this, this is an exact equality. But oftentimes, if you want, you want to get the full general solution. So this is the, does not give, give you the full general solution. It's just a particular solution. If you want to get the full general solution, you must. One way to do this, one very clever way to do this is, in fact, to solve the uh, the corresponding homogeneous differential equation. Homogeneous differential equation simply means there is no driving term. So you take this original equation you had d squared x by dt squared equal to minus x plus cosine of omega t and then you remove this driving part. So, then you are left with a homogeneous differential equation which is relatively easier to solve. In fact, in our case we know how, already know the solution. So, if you pull out the general solution of the homogeneous differential equation and you just simply add it to your one particular solution, then that gives you your, gives you the full general solution of the full problem. This is the theory, right. And it is also intuitive why this should work out, right. If you take any solution to this differential equation, right, d squared x by dt squared equal to minus x, then it is not a surprise that if you can, you can just take a solution of this differential equation and add it to a particular solution and it's, it should still work out in the other case because you have this extra added term, you know, the, this part is going to, uh, is only going to give you 0, right. It is going to cancel out and the particular solution is any way going to respect the full differential equation, right. So, if you are a little bit unconvinced about this, I urge you to explicitly take xp and xc, which I will tell you what it is in a moment and then plug this back into your original differential equation and check for yourself that indeed it is going to be a solution of the full driven oscillator problem, right. So, this is a standard and quite a beautiful method of solving differential equations of this kind. So, what is the general solution of d squared x by dt squared equal to minus x that we already know and so that is the complementary solution. So, once again I urge you to look at exercises a, b and c and pause the video solve for these bits before you proceed, right. So, if you make this into a habit, then your learning is, is enhanced, right. You actively try out something and then cross check against my solution. Perhaps you have an alternate way of doing things and maybe there is um, more learning which comes out when you have multiple approaches, okay. So, in fact, you have this A, B, C, D, E, all of which you should try out. Pause the video now, try out A, B, C, D, E and then look at the solution. So, complementary solution is, is well known, right. It is simply C1 of cosine, co, C1 times cosine of t plus C2 
sine of t. So these c1 and c2 are arbitrary constants and uh, they have to be fixed based on initial conditions, right? So this is where the initial conditions are hidden. The initial conditions are hidden in the uh, complementary solution. So I told I gave you the particular solution has somehow washed away the initial conditions, which is what you expect because in a steady state must in fact lose all the information about where the system started from. So in that sense, uh, the particular solution uh, better not carry any information about the initial conditions. But here C1 and C2 are two free constants which we can uh, determine based on the initial conditions. So we will do that in a moment, right. So this is the general solution and the general solution of the full inhomogeneous differential equation, inhomogeneous in other words the forced differential equation, the driven oscillator problem is simply C1 cosine of t plus C2 sine of t plus 1 over 1 minus omega squared times cosine of omega t. So I told you it is as simple as that. You take the full general solution of the uh, complementary solution and then simply add it to the particular solution and you are done. So this is the full general solution of the differential equation. And then we plug in the initial conditions. We have told that x of 0 is equal to 1, x dot of 0 is equal to 0. And this tells us that in our problem we must fix our C1 to be 1 minus 1 by 1 minus omega squared and C2 to be 0. And lo and behold, we have the full final answer. This is the full solution for our particular problem. It has embedded in it information about the initial condition. So x of t, if now here I can go ahead and put x of 0, I can do x dot of 0 and they will agree with with uh, the initial conditions that have been specified, right. So now, now that we have the full solution, we can go ahead and plot it, right. Once again, I use this very nice uh, command called manipulate where I can vary this parameter omega and check out what it looks like. So I have when omega equal to 0, of course, nothing is happening and then I can slowly increase omega and then I see I get a, you know, uh, oscillatory solution, which is not a surprise looking at the kind of functional form that I am plotting. So what is very interesting is what happens as we go closer and closer to omega equal to 1, right. So I told you that the resonance happens at omega equal to 1, but if I am not sitting at omega, but very close to omega equal to 1, then I see these uh, these oscillations, but of, of a slightly different frequency. There is like a amplitude modulation happening here, right. So, and if you think for a moment, you realize that this is really all that is happening is uh, some kind of beat phenomena, right. So, here we have, uh, I am trying to superpose two cosines. If both of these cosines, the, the frequencies corresponding to them are close to each other, that is when the beat phenomenon is evident, right. So this is something that I urge you to go back and play with. So if you are sitting at 1, of course, it will not be seen. So around 0.99 is when you see beat phenomena in a very nice way. 0.99 is difficult to interpret, I guess. Okay, so this is something for you to play with, right. So this is a plot. Now. Let us ask the question, what happens when if I put omega equal to 1, right, I, after all I have a an external forcing term, I am free to choose this external forcing uh, frequency to be whatever I want. So but if it looks like if I just blindly put omega equal to 1 in this solution, it seems like it is going to blow up. So why should I get a solution which is blowing up when? Uh, the original differential equation is completely legitimate. There is no, if I if I had started my problem with, with uh, you know, the differential equation itself, if I had started with omega equal to 1 inbuilt in it, I should have been able to work out the full solution of it, which is of course the case. But it turns out that what you have to do here is you cannot blindly just put omega equal to 1, but you must 
carefully take the limit. So it is of the 0 by 0 form and if you take the limit, so this is an exercise for you to do, right. I am not doing it here, but it is just a quick uh, exercise if you are familiar with this kind of stuff, which I assume you are. You, you can use for example the L'Hopital rule. You take a derivative of the function in the numerator and derivative of the function in the denominator and then take the value, put the limit omega going to 1, then you will get x of t equal to cos t plus t by 2 sin of t, right. So, so this is, uh, so a remark here is that if you, if you take a course on differential equation at some point or if you might have already seen it, you will see that there are certain very special cases where one has to be careful with the onsorts one makes and so uh, depending upon depending upon the nature of the forcing term. So, you have cosine of omega t, if omega is a certain value which is connected to a certain root of a quadratic equation on the left hand side. If if it, it turns out to be equal to that one, right. I mean, I am not going to give you the details so that you can look up some textbook on differential equations. Then the correct onsorts will be actually t times sin of t. So, this factor of t would come in even within the formal theory of differential equations itself. So, that way you could have got to this uh, solution directly. If you had started your original differential equation itself, put omega equal to 1 and worked it out, then you would have had to. Uh, you know, implant this t times sin of t itself, right. So, this is an exercise for you to try and carry out, but if you, if you miss this remark or if you did not follow it, uh, this remark, maybe you should just wait till you uh, encounter the theory of differential equations in some slightly more advanced course. But for now, let us say that just taking the limit omega equal to 1 in the, in the right way will already give us this solution. So, let us plot this. Plotting is very instructive. So, we see that as uh, for larger and larger time, the amplitude keeps on increasing, right. So, there is a very systematic way in which the amplitude will keep increasing and if I take the limit t going to infinity, then I have these oscillations become really large and uh, so this is something that we have already seen. Right, where we saw, we saw that the square of the amplitude of the steady state solution is infinite at omega equal to 1. So, we are considering this omega equal to 1 case, but we are looking at the full solution x of t as a function of time is completely well defined because this is the, this includes the transients, right. So, there is a transient part and there is a, there is a, uh, uh, there is a part which is called the steady state. So, and uh, at any finite time, there is a very precise value of x of t, right. It is just that you see from this plot that for larger and larger times, the, uh, the, the amplitude of oscillation becomes very, very large, right. So, this is quite instructive. So, by the way, you could have also used, uh, we could have taken Mathematica's help to evaluate this limit. So, there is this function called limit. You can just plug in the function there and take the limit omega going to 1 it will give you cosine of t plus half times t times sine of t, which is what we obtained analytically, right. So, so the Mathematica is a powerful tool to cross check your results. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it is good to have multiple ways of checking, right. So, it is uh, even though uh, Mathematica can directly do it for you, it is better to use it as a cross checking device, first do it yourself and then get Mathematica to do it, cross check and then depend entirely on Mathematica only for problems where you cannot do it, like for example, hardcore numerics. So, that is why we should do a lot of checks for small cases, simple cases and then stretch it to the more difficult cases later on. So, this is a standard tool. So, now what do we want to do? We want to see if we can reproduce this from a purely numerical method, right, which is in the spirit of this whole course, which is in the spirit of the philosophy behind this course is to find a numerical perspective for this. So, let us recall how we can take any higher order differential equation and put it into the canonical form, right. So, I told you that 
this differential equation that we have is linear, but it is of order 2, second order linear uh, differential equation, inhomogeneous differential equation, that is the classification from a differential equation point of view. So, no matter what the order of your differential equation is, it is possible to bring it down to effectively first order, but involving more variables and that is the form that is most suitable for uh, the application of a numerical method, right. Like the Euler's method is the simplest numerical way of solving a differential equation, right. If you have only one variable, all it entails is saying, okay, if I want to solve dx by dt is equal to some function x comma t or I, I will replace dx by dt by xn plus 1 minus xn divided by some delta. So, xn plus 1 is equal to xn plus that small delta times the derivative at that point, right numerical and then you go to the next step and then you go to the next step and so on. You, you slowly build it up and there is a small delta, right, which controls the accuracy of your numerical method. The smaller it is, the more accurate it is and if you want uh, greater accuracy, you will have to shrink your delta and therefore, it will co consume more resources. So, later on we will see how you can uh, dramatically improve the efficiency of this method by doing some small modifications. So, there is something called the improved Euler method and then there is a more fancy one which is called the runge kutta method. So, improved Euler method itself is a, is a form of the RK method. So, we will discuss these at a later time, but for now let us recall how to recast our higher order differential equation into the canonical form. So, what you do is you, you just simply introduce more variables. So, you had x double dot, so but you define x dot itself as you know a function uh, as y. So, in this case let us do this. So, I have uh, we will see that example in a moment, right. So, if you have x dot is equal to f, y dot equal to g and z dot equal to h, you can rewrite your whole equation as, as the derivative of a vector x dot is equal to f. In the Euler's method simply gives you x naught equal to x initial and xn plus 1 is equal to xn plus h times f of xn, which is what I just said and uh, which will uh, be discussed in a separate video in detail, right. So, we have this implementation of the Euler general method, which was carried out in an earlier uh, video which you should go back and watch. So, I am not going to go into the details of this, right. So, this is basically implementing this algorithm. So, there is this nice way of uh, compact way of putting all these together in inputs and then uh, here I am going to I have just borrowed this code, I am going to run this and then use it. So, first I have to if I even if I have to use this as a black box, I should know how to input stuff, how to output stuff, how to analyze it, right. So, my differential equation is, is d squared x dt squared plus blah blah blah. So, first I am going to introduce the new variable dx by dt is equal to v, and then I have dv by dt is equal to minus x plus cosine of omega t. So, that is enough. So, I, I have only two variables and then I have x of 0 equal 1, v of 0 equal to 0. So, in vector form I have capital X is equal to t is also defined as a variable here as because it is convenient to do numerics in this way, then my differential equation can be just simply written down as x dot is equal to f. It is a effectively first order differential equation, but for a vector now. Then I have to define my identity, right. So, I define an identity function. So, it takes in the input of time, uh, position and speed x, t, x and v, but it just gives me 1 because I know that x dot equal to f. If I look at the first row, I just want it to be 1. The To get the second row, I use x dot is equal to equal to v. So, all of this I implement in, in one cell. There you go. And then I also have to define my initial vector. So, I know that at time t equal to 0, my uh, position is 1 and speed is 0. And then if I if I choose a certain omega and then I can simply go ahead and implement this. So, I have to put in the these functions i d x dot and v dot. 
then I have to give you the initial conditions which I have already written down here 0, 1, 0. Then I have to choose these numbers 100 and 10,000. So 100 is gives me the time steps up to which I am going to uh, run my simulation up to a certain time t and that is chosen to be 100 and 10,000 is, is where the information about the individual time steps. So the larger this number here is the more fine the simulation is and so the more accurate it is going to be right. So let so the, of course the flip side is that it is going to take longer for your code to run. So let me run this for 10,000. So I have the data has come out already and I am going to compare against the analytical solution I have. There you go. So you see that the uh, agreement is, is good but around these bends it somewhat it, it, it misses the details right. So this has to do with the fact that you know whenever there are these kind of bends the, uh, the derivative is, uh, is inaccurate and the inaccuracy in the de derivative is uh, exaggerated and therefore uh, the agreement between the numerics and the theory is not that great. So you can go ahead and play with this. So maybe I will try one more. If I make this 20,000, let us see if the uh, accuracy becomes better. It has become slightly better, but may, but if you want to really increase it to a much larger time, it is going to take a while for it to run. So I will allow you to play with this, but a better thing to do is actually to improve the quality of your algorithm. Right? So you can use something called the improved Euler function method. which we will discuss at some point or it is going to be part of a homework and even better than improved Euler is the RK4 method which is also something that we will discuss after some time. So let us see what happens if I put omega equal to 1. So if I put omega equal to 1, it is going to take a while. So there you go. Once again we see that surely there is very good agreement but it is not, it is not exact the uh, agreement between the analytical curve and the purely numerical uh, run and it is going to be by a larger and larger margin as time uh, time increases particularly around these uh, you know point of highest amplitude and point, point of uh, lowest uh, amplitude right whenever the system is turning around sharply that is where the information about the derivative is not so accurate. Okay, so that is what I wanted to cover in this uh, module. So the main message here is that there is the physics of the driven oscillator comes out very nicely. So a full analytical solution is possible and with the help of Mathematica or with the help of a numerical uh, tool like the Euler method which is a very, very simple way to solve a differential equation and we, we, sh we show that uh, it is possible to solve it numerically and the two approaches give us results which agree very closely and if you want to make the agreement uh, better and better, you must choose your uh, discretization, you must make uh, you know the runs in your numerical program, the times involved uh, for um, you know the incremental time involved should become smaller and smaller right. So there are details of how the error scales with h and so on is not the focus of this course but if you take a course on numerical methods or you know computational methods and so on there is a very systematic and mathematical way to um, work out the strength or weakness of an algorithm uh, quantitatively. You can say why uh, Euler method is you know uh, the errors are of a certain order and how improved Euler is, is better and how RK4 is even better and so on. But let us not go into that, that is not the focus of this course at least at this point. The main message here is of course these two methods work and uh, we should go back and play more. And so the one thing that you should try out is to work out the same problem for the circuit equivalent and the other thing is to include a damping term, if you so you know, the same kind of uh, techniques will hold. You can have a damping term where um, you know there's a frictional force which tends to uh, slow down your particle. The greater its speed, the smaller its 
so the greater is the uh, frictional force. So you can have a term like d squared x by dt squared um, uh, plus x, but also something like uh, dx by dt with a constant b minus uh, minus b times dx by dt in the original equation. Right? So that is also worth trying out. But that is it for now. We will come back with more improved methods in the next module. Thank you.